I, over the years, have heard people make this same sort of statement. It, it, it's sometimes different words, but this is the general thrust of the statement. They say things like, they're talking about failure in their life and, and like another failure has come into their life and they'll, they'll ask a question it, it, and this is the question, is there something wrong with me? And I think the thing that gets me when people interpret their circumstances down to that statement, that there's something wrong with me, is that it's, it's an attack on their very identity based on the circumstances that they are in. And the truth is, you know this. We all fail. Somehow, somewhere, at some time, with something, we're going to fail. Now, if it's burning the toast, that's, that's no big deal unless, this is for you, Joel, you're black toast intolerant. Black toast, black toast, black, unless you're... You, you, you can at least smile, Joel. <laughs> right. But see, if, if, it's, if it's your marriage that's failed, or if you're in a financial mess, if, if you've lost your reputation, if you've lost a friendship, um, if it's a dream that's died, that's painful. Failure equals pain. And, and it's not just that trauma that you feel from failure that really gets you. It, it, it can actually get so much into you that it actually attacks your life in the sense that you, you, you feel like your f life has been derailed. If you do something often enough, consistently enough, over a long period of time, eventually you'll actually get it wrong. A number of years ago... We were watching the news and, you know, when they have this, all the skydivers and, and they jump out of the plane and they, they get form, formed together and, they, and a camera guy jumps out and he, he films it all. Well, the camera guy jumped out and he's filming them all as they're jumping out of the plane and then suddenly you see his camera going like this all over the place because when he jumped out of the plane, you think, got me goggles, got me um, camera got my gloves. At some point he realised, oops, I forgot my parachute. It was his 800th jump. This, like, it's true. It, it, it was his 800th jump. He'd done it so often that he jumped out without his parachute. And, and he's filming everyone above you. There's no one that could save him. And he, and he died. And it's, it's just, if we do something often enough, somehow we, we, we mess it up somehow. And what adds to the pain of failure is that it's, it's often in an area that we actually want to succeed in, that we want to do well in, and, and things go wrong. And, like, what do you do? How do you come back if you failed your kids? I know there are times that, as a dad, I've messed up, and, and I wish I could replace some of those things. How do you come back? And our culture... It tends to build us up for success. You're born to succeed. But it's not much help when it comes to dealing with failure. Either our, our culture is silent or they say things that just aren't helpful. Now, I, I did a little Google search on what to do when we fail. And these are some of the things that, that they said we should do. Consider every failure in your life as a milestone towards success. Well, I've sat with people and every time they've failed, all they do is take on, there's something wrong with me. Why, why can't I succeed when other people are? And, and, and another one was develop a personal resilience statement. Like, that's a joke. A personal resilience statement. And, and I'll, I won't keep going through it because it's a waste of time, but I'll, there's just one more. And they said, stop complaining, vent once or twice, and then suck it up. That's really helpful. No, no, it's not. So, so what do we do 
when we fail. Because I know in my own life, every significant failure that I've walked through has been a character failure within me. I, I can, on two occasions, I really damaged significant close friendships with two mates of mine on separate occasions because I thought I'd hung up the phone and then I started talking about them. And on both occasions, they heard what I said about them. And if it wasn't for their grace towards me, we could not have restored that relationship. That was a character flaw on my heart behalf. And the business decisions that I made in my early 30s that eventually led to us losing everything we owned, that was, that was a character flaw within me because I wasn't willing to listen to wisdom and advice from other people. I was just set and doing my own thing and building my little empire and I was going to do it no matter what. I end up walking away from everything God had called me to do in life when I did that. And that's just the, the tip of the iceberg of all the little character flaws that have dogged my life. I've often described myself as a, a recycled failure. And the harsh reality of human existence is that every failure that we are affected by, it either comes from a failure within our own character or someone else's or a combination of both. We lost our farm because someone did the wrong thing by me in business. But I entered to that, into that partnership with them. It was my decision. I'm, I can only be the, the only one responsible for where that went. Now, Joel, this is just a little bit of information for you, right? But Joel, the personality which I love that you have... God gave that to you. Your personality is a gift to everyone who knows you. But you were born with that. Our character, that's something that we develop over time. And I, I want you to imagine that our character is like a container. And it's, it's see-through. It's transparent. And it contains a lot of very special things. It's designed to contain, our character contains things, it also is to protect them. So in our, ah, did that up too tight so it didn't leak in the car. So inside our character are things like our beliefs and our values. There's also our gifts and talents are contained within our character. God's purpose for our life, his, his call upon us, that's in there. See, our, our character is like, it, it's, a, it's our moral self. And within it is our honesty, our integrity, our loyalty, um, even our habits and our motives are contained within our character, our ambitions. But your character doesn't just hold all those sorts of things. It doesn't just protect those things. It, it actually holds something that I want to focus on this morning. And it's, it's different but it's really, really significant. It's an account. And see, every time our character is proven through tests, people, not us, other people make a little deposit into our life. Every time that, say you may say you believe in something, that you have certain values, you have certain convictions, when they are tested, which they will be, 
and you come through that, people see that character and they put a deposit into this account in your life. I can turn pages with my left hand. When we fail a character test, that account gets shut down. Not, not by us, but by other people. So what account am I talking about? Well, it's a trust account. And, and trust is, is the currency of life. When you succeed in life, whether it be um, any area of life, it's not your personality, it's not your money, it's not the position you hold, it's not your talents and gifts that enables you to succeed in life. It's the trust that people put into you. Now, if that trust is broken, we lose everything. I want you to imagine this hammer was something that happened through your character and it caused your character to fail. And this is what happens. You lose everything. It's all gone. I'm glad that worked. I tried it at home a few times, it wouldn't work. And what happened was eventually that glass got a crack in it. And so I, you, you saw the crack, didn't you? And so, because I was smashing it this morning and it was going everywhere else, but that's the first time it worked. So I'm, I'm sort of pleased about that. Right? But, but when something is a character failure and we lose trust, how do we come back from that? Well, Paul, who wrote a big chunk of the New Testament, he had a problem. He had two people he cared about, and one of them had blown trust with the other person. And Paul took it on personally to try and restore the relationship between the two people. And he wrote a letter to a guy called Philemon. And it's only 25 verses long. I thought we'd make it into a, a six-part series, but no, we, we're just going to cover it today. right? But there's enough in it. This is an amazing, amazing letter that's included in our Bible. And it, it's one of those letters you sort of skip over because you, you think it's a personal letter between Paul and Philemon and a guy who was a slave called on Onis Onesimus. I think I got it out. I was just going to change it to onesie, but on Onesimus. Yep. So, 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 so Paul has this problem. Trust has been completely destroyed because Onesimus has not only ran away from his master, but he's stolen from him. And he's about, he's travelled about, 1,600 k's from where he was meant to be to Rome. Now, under Roman law, a slave was not even human. They were just something you owned. And if a slave did the wrong thing by his master, the punishment was not just death by firing squad, that would be easy, it was actually crucifixion. It was... It had to be a reminder to every other slave that don't run away from your master. And so the failure of character in Onesimus, where he stole and, and ran away, we might think he had reasons for running away. But in that culture, he had done the wrong thing. It's... It's a problem of humanity where we fail with our character. But how we respond, that's really the critical thing because we will all fail, but we won't all respond the same. Now, Brian Houston from Hillsong 
has achieved so much in building God's kingdom up, in, in showing churches what is possible, in, in the influence of Hillsong throughout the world through our personal lives in the, the Hillsong conferences we went to and, and our own daughter was um, for 10 years a, a frontline worship leader at Hillsong. And, and so we've seen all the good. But there got to be a place where Brian lost trust with his leadership and they asked him to stay within certain bounds, which he didn't. And eventually... It got to a place where he offered his resignation in writing. He put it into his, his board, into his leadership team. And he was shocked and upset that they accepted it. He didn't understand that what can take 40 years to build in his trust account can be lost in 40 seconds. It's gone. And when it's gone, it's gone. And... And, and you can't come back and say, but I did this and I, I built this and I achieved this and, and, and so fight for me. No. When trust is gone, you're disqualified. It's gone. And, and, and I don't think Brian fully understood that when he put his resignation in. He thought they'd fight for him, but they couldn't. Because he had disqualified himself and it was over. When a husband, a wife, a, a friend, a boss, a, a work colleague, when, when there's a, a character failure, trust is gone. And, and, you, and you can't blame other people. You, you can't say, but I've been... This, this, and, and add it all up and make it an equation. See, this is the only equation that works when it comes to trust. If you draw a line like this and you write above it the word tests and put beneath it the word time equals trust. Tests over time equals trust. And it only takes a, a moment to undo everything that's gone beforehand. And the only one that can protect that trust account is us with our character. We're the only ones responsible. And you can feel really bad and you can cry and you can plead and ask for forgiveness, but it won't restore the trust account. See, forgiveness can be given like that, but that's not how trust works. And, and when we give forgiveness to someone who has broken our trust, what we're saying really is, I'm going to give you time and space to rebuild what is lost. Forgiveness is not the restoration of trust. And forgiveness can begin the process, but it's not the process. And it's impossible for us to influence anyone in our world without trust. In fact, when you lose trust, people will even sabotage your success. Because when people don't want you to win, you cannot win. It's why trust is such a big thing. Now, I was watching one of those little Facebook reels and there was a car broken down in about a five-lane highway somewhere overseas. And I'm watching this car, and all these other cars are coming behind it at really high speed, going around it, trucks coming, going around it. And I'm thinking, get that car off the freeway. And then a big truck coming along in that lane, somehow didn't see the car was stopped, and slammed into the back of it, and it was a horrific accident. See, we know that if our car breaks down, you get it off the road. You, you don't, like, I know you had an accident in your car the other day, right? The first thing you do is you try to get it off the road. Because if it stays broken down on the road, it's going to cause more accidents. 
you, you got to tow it away and, and, and get it to a mechanic. And, and, and when we fail in our character and, and we lose trust, we, we can't just stay where we were. We, we've got to get to a mechanic. We've, we, we've got to get repaired. We can't just try and hold our position because more people get broken. In my role in Sydney when we, we planted a church up there, which we led for nine years, but, but I got the privilege of being part of a, a small team that looked after 55 churches for one-third of Sydney. And we got the privilege of sitting with pastors, encouraging them and, and walking through all the stuff that can go off in church life. And there was one church and the pastor of that church had become a really close friend to me. And then we discovered that um, he'd been having an affair with his, someone in his church for seven years. And it became public. And we tried to help him by moving his broken down vehicle off the centre of the road and to come out of leadership and to come through restoration and, and but he refused and so instead of staying as an ACC church he said no nah, I'm not going to I'm, I'm going to become an independent church and I'm going to still keep leading my church and I've asked my church for forgiveness so it's all okay well, that caused more and more damage. It was a disaster because he was unwilling to understand or accept that trust was broken, that forgiveness wasn't the way back. He had to re-establish trust and he needed his little vehicle taken to the mechanics to be repaired. In my own life, when I had gone and built my own little empire and it all collapsed and fallen down. I can remember going to a, like a spiritual mentor's home, um, Elsie Johnson, who had had such influence in my life for many years and for Coral, and, and talking with her about the heartache that I felt with losing everything we had and walking away from the youth ministry God had called me to, and somewhere at her lounge room table, God got through and I dropped all the excuses and all the blame on everyone else and I realised that it was me. It was just me. I'd made the decisions and, and the youth that I'd been leading now were all scattered and I was responsible and the, and the grief and the heartache and the... I remember, you know when you cry, ugly cry, and it's not just, <laughs> it's like, and it's, it's, it's running, every, I, it was just traumatic. But for me to admit that I'm responsible was the turning point in my life that day, and it stands out as a significant way forward that God began the restoration process in me. And see, the good news is that when we fail, our gifts are still there. Our talents are still there. God's call upon your life is still there. There may be a detour. You may have to get the vehicle off the road, but, but who you are is still there. And see, what God wants to do is actually start a process. The old character might have had some flaws, but... With God's spirit in us, he rebuilds character. And we can once again contain all the things and the container can protect. And people can see that it's healthy. Now, I mentioned the story of Philemon. It's such a powerful story. And I used to think that it was just between Paul and Philemon and Onesimus, three people. But I was wrong. When you look at the start of this letter, it's a letter addressed not just from Paul but from Timothy. And it's, and it's, and it's written to Philemon, the wealthy 
slave owner, but also to the church that is held in his home. And it names people as part of the church. This letter was read out to the whole church. It wasn't a private letter. And, and here's the thing. This letter that Paul writes, he gives it to Onesimus to travel 1,600 kilometres back to his hometown and knock on Philemon's door and say, hello, remember me? <laughs> Got a letter for you. Like, Philemon didn't know Onesimus was coming back until he turned up with a letter in his hand. He's carrying this letter, and this is what happens in the letter. It's not a letter about please forgive Onesimus. It's a letter about restoring trust. I want to read to you one part of that letter. In verse 16, Paul, like Paul sets this up, but in verse 16, Paul says, please, please don't consider him a slave anymore, but as a dear brother. Do you know how radical that must have been? And then he says, consider him a man. No, no longer is no longer no human being because he's just a slave. He's not human. No, no, now consider him a man a brother in the Lord. Don't take him back just as a, as a slave, but I want you to accept him as a brother. Because, see, Paul brought Philemon to Jesus. He discipled him at some point in the past. And then he now has discipled Onesimus. How did that happen? Because Paul was in prison. Onesimus didn't just happen to be walking past one day and Paul lead him to God and they're they chatting about things. And, 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 and one day Paul says to Onesimus, where are you from? He says, oh, I'm from Colossus or wherever it was. And, oh, I know a bloke there, Philemon. Oh, yeah, that's, that's me boss. Uh, uh, that's not how it happened. See, Onesimus somehow must have bumped into some Christians in Rome and told his story about this trust failure. And they must have brought him to Paul because Paul's in prison. He can't go anywhere. Onesimus came to Paul and Paul led him to Jesus and Paul discipled him and he became a really big help to Paul while he's in prison. And then in the restoration process... Paul sends him back with this letter. And in verse 17, he says this. So if you consider me as your partner, is Paul, is Paul talking to, Anis, to Philemon? If you consider me as a, as a brother in Christ, as, as a partner, if you trust me, welcome him. Trust him as you would welcome me. What happened was Paul is leveraged in the trust that he has with Philemon. And he's saying, Philemon, if you trust me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to back this guy. He's blown trust with you. You have no account left. It's, it's gone. You don't trust him, but I do. So don't trust him, trust me. And if he's stolen from you, I'll repay everything. I'll put it on my account. What Onesimus did was he went and found an authority to come under to restore him and then to back him. And that's how it works in God's kingdom. When, when we've lost trust with someone, it takes in the natural long, long time to restore it. In fact, it can even take longer to rebuild trust once it's blown than it did in the first place to build it. It's a very, very long process. And sometimes people will never trust you again. But if you come under, if you hoopo, if you come under an authority that can vouch for you, that can leverage the fact that they are trusted. See, 
when Peter blew it with Jesus, the night Jesus was arrested, denied him, went off crying in the dark. Do you know he blew trust not just with Jesus but with the rest of the team? Nobody trusted Peter. Nobody. So how did Peter come back to be such a significant leader in the early church? Jesus, when he came back to life, sent a message to the disciples to gather at Galilee. And this is the message. He says, go and tell the boys, go and tell my disciples and Peter that I'm going to meet you at Galilee and Peter. If Peter had just turned up unannounced, the other disciples would have said, get out of here, mate. You're, you're a liability. We don't trust you. Just you're not welcome. But he was there by invitation of Jesus. And Jesus restored him in front of them. See, when we, when we come under someone like Jesus who will vouch for us, when we come under leadership that will help restore us, that our world doesn't have a discipleship program for other human beings. Jesus does. God does. It, it's how church works as a family. Where we, where we come under, where we, we share our stuff with each other. Like, even in the last few days, I've had the privilege of sitting with some people and, and sharing their brokenness and, and, their, and their pain and, and praying for them and seeing God do amazing things. Some of those people aren't even part of Red Garment. I've, I've had this privilege of sitting down with them. It's, it's how it works when, when we have lost stuff and, and it can't be put back easily if we come under someone that will help restore us and they'll take their credibility and their character and, and, and their trust that people have in them and say, I vouch for them. And even if they mess up, I'll, I'll cover it. That's kingdom. It's how God restores it's a beautiful thing. I've experienced it. I, I'm, I'm standing here today as a recycled failure that someone has believed in when I haven't believed in me. Yeah. And, and, and God loves to take our brokenness and bring complete healing and wholeness and restoration, yeah. Can I get the band back up, thanks. God, I thank you that you are in the business of restoring people. You made us, <laughs> you can fix us. And what could take a lifetime to rebuild, you can, you can do it through a different process, a process of ministry, of... of, of healing of putting things back together in the right order and for us to be able to vouch for one another that we could do that with confidence because of what we're seeing in someone's life do you know I've, I've had the privilege of sitting with a husband who has been unfaithful to their wife and, and, and sitting with the wife and and saying, you don't trust him anymore. And he knows that. But do you know what? I do. Because I'm not as emotionally in invested in this as you are. And, and, and I want to walk the two of you back into wholeness. I've seen that happen. It's possible. Anything is possible with God in the restoration of people. I, I just love it. So um, do you want to do that last? Or which song do you want to do? You, do, you choose one. What do you want to do, Steve? I'll do the new one. You're going to do the new one? You do the new one. That would yeah. be great. Yep. So, look, just, just before we start, I know you're keen, Joel, but, but if you want to have a chat with Coral and I about anything at any time or other leaders, we, we're here for you. It, it's, it's why we do church together. Like the home groups this week was fantastic, having you know, people gathering together. It's where wholeness and healing comes. 
And um, so, yeah, just let us know if you want to have a chat about anything.